Hello, um, good morning and welcome from Scotland. So um, we're back to another session of um, the Hippocratics University of Edinburgh Global Health Academy webinar series. This time we're going to be focusing on developing the generalist doctor for the new normal in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my name is Ali Mahdi. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Scotland, and um, I'm going to be joined by a very distinguished panel who's going to be talking on this subject. Now, just a little introduction about why we're here. Of course, you know, the world's opened up with the COVID-19 pandemic, thanks to technology that's exponentially boomed. But uh, there have been other less positive ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, there have been huge political, economical, and sociological changes at a global level, nationally, and for you locally, and I suppose, you know, in our workplace. And you could ask yourself, is this a time for change? So the 1918 pandemic, World War I, World War II, uh, lots of events such as those led to major changes, major shifts. Now for the past 30 to 40 years, depending on which part of the world you are in, uh, the model of medicine appears to have shifted more towards the specialist model away from the primary care model. I remember um, my family physician was my role model. That was, if you like, the person because of whom I wanted to become a doctor. But that has changed. If you ask somebody of a younger generation, I suppose they would be looking towards a specialist as a role model. Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, one would have to ask, are we now needing to go back to a different or back to focusing on primary care as a model? According to Donald Berwick, who is the founder of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement um, in Boston, um, the choices for the new normal are the speed of learning and change. So, you know, technologically, there has been this, this exponential drive of having online education. But the questions, key questions that he has posed is, should we be moving to a standardization of care in, in, in places where it has not been adopted as a model? We have already, moved to virtual consulting. Um, hence, you know, we've had sessions on online education and we've been discussing if we should incorporate the role of the virtual clinic into medical education and preparing people for that particular environment. Preparing the workforce is a big concern, but his top concern in a recent webinar was inequity. Inequity because of the political socioeconomic shift, particularly the socioeconomic shift. So we will be having speakers who will talk about how um, they have experienced inequities in delivering healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. But above all, we'll be asking some very pertinent questions relating to the model of medical education and the need for developing the generalist doctor. So our panel. So we've got with us Dr. Ms. Sujata Rao. She's a key opinion leader in healthcare. So uh, some of you will know her. She used to be the Union Secretary of Health of the Government of India, but recently she has been a very vocal proponent for the need of primary health care, especially in serving the needs of the general population. Um, Professor Chako joins us from Kerala, and he is um, the Dean of BCMC Medical College, and um, he's also the President of the Academy of healthcare professional educators, a member of the expert panel of the World Federation of Medical Education, Professor Chalam, who is an old friend of ours on this panel, who is the principal of Pasca Medical College and the president of the Association of Medical Educators. Dr. Srinivas is the dean of ESIC Medical College in Hyderabad, apart from being a professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. We've got Mr. Mushtaba Askari, founder of Helping Hands Foundation, which is a non-governmental organization that runs primary care practices. Dr. Konapa is a primary care physician in Hyderabad who will be given, giving his perspective on the need for primary care. From Iraq, we're joined by Dr. Abu Tahim, who is a consultant family physician and a supervisor um, of the Arab Board of Specialties. And uh, he joins us from the city of Karbala. 
From Bangladesh, we are joined by a senior primary care respiratory physician and the president of the Bangladesh uh, Primary Care Respiratory Society, um, Dr. Monsoor. Sheetal Bhandari joins us from the Patan Academy of Medical Sciences in Nepal, and the Patan Academy focuses on medical care. From the UK, we've got Professor Liz Grant, um, the director of the Global Health Academy, under whom um, this meeting is, um, under whose auspices this meeting is, Dr. Angus Grant, a general practitioner, and Professor Neil Turner, who is the Dean of Undergraduate Teaching and Learning at the University of Edinburgh. So I'd like to welcome you all. Um, firstly, Liz, would you like to say anything? Bring Liz on. Sorry, small lag. Lovely. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone as well. It is wonderful to have such a wide um, group of people here um, and a panel of experts who really understand why family medicine and primary care are going to make the changes for the 21st century. So I'm very much looking forward to this hour and a half being a time of discussion, a time when you can enter questions into the chat room and, and ask off the panel, a time for reflecting, and hopefully a time of change that we can begin to build up momentum with this community who understand that, that primary care and family medicine working in primary care really matters. So thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. So what I'm going to do is, Dr. Sujatha Rao um, is in transit between Hyderabad and Delhi just now. So she is going to join us later, but I will start a, a discussion that I had with her earlier. Okay, well, welcome, uh, Mr. Sujatha Rao. Uh, this is an absolute pleasure and privilege that a person of your standing and experience who is such a strong proponent of primary health care has been able to spare your time. I'm conscious that you, know, you have had to commit this time uh, in amongst other arrangements, uh, flying to Delhi from Hyderabad and um, returning um, home after that. So um, you have been talking about primary, the need for primary health care for a long time. And in fact, I would invite the participants to go onto YouTube and Ali, we are not hearing. Can you hear now? Pretty important topics are central to all of us today on primary health care. So uh, if you don't mind, I would just like to give a couple of my thoughts on what I think about primary care as a generic uh, requirement in the health sector. And I would like to contextualize it with uh, within the COVID uh, a pandemic um, that we are facing today. I mean, you know that uh, never before any of the participants that are there today in your discussion group have ever, ever been uh, experienced anything so confounding as the COVID pandemic. And we've had since 2004, SARS and various other viral outbreaks, Ebola and MERS and swine flu, bird flu, and a series of them. And in 2010, we had H1N1 pandemic, which hurt millions of lives. I think in the US alone, about 67 million of lives got H1N1, but not at all fatal. Whereas COVID-19 seems to be a different genre altogether, the speed and the scale of its spread and impact on human lives has been so devastating. Uh, fatal for the vulnerable and emotionally, economically, psychologically, and socially, completely draining for the rest of us who live in society. So the one takeaway from this experience of COVID, which I have witnessed uh, roll out in India, and that comes close to, uh, has been you know, coming to my thoughts very, uh, frequently is the need for a strong primary health care. I mean, my conviction for uh, founding and developing and building our health system on the foundation of a strong primary health care 
as only got strengthened with this COVID experience. Uh, poor primary health care has impacted us to spend substantial amounts of money on hospitals. And as you know, we've had to scramble all our resources to get ICUs uh, in the number required. A uh, lot of hospitals are having uh, facilities for giving oxygen to patients, the numerous number of patients. In fact, the whole system faced a huge stress factor. And at the peak, we even found in hospitals with patients on corridors with that oxygen cylinders on the side. So it really did strain the formal health system, which was an institution-based uh, system. And that could have been averted, I believe, if we had had a strong uh, primary health care. Uh, the primary health care is not just about, as you know, providing treatment for minor ailments at the clinics which are closest to the people who are in uh, homes. Its foundational principle is actively involving and engaging the uh, community. Uh, it's centered on the concept of ensuring you promote the health and well-being of the community. So it's a very integrated, a very holistic, and a very uh, you know, controlling and averting disease rather than taking care of patients and of the people after they get uh, sick. So its main strength has been to prevent any outbreaks. And we saw its strengths in Sierra Leone and Liberia. I think that is one example I keep quoting everywhere because it was remarkable to see that US gave at the time when Ebola struck Sierra Leone about a couple of years ago, almost over a billion dollars and set up the most sophisticated hospitals. But the real truth, if you go deep dive into how the, the Ebola was contained in those two countries was only through primary care and community participation. It was not the hospital or the specialist who could control the spread of the disease. So the sooner the governments and medical fraternity acknowledge the importance of primary care and the central role of the generalist who looks at disease in a more holistic and integrated manner than the specialist, the better for building sustainable health systems. The tragedy unfolding in the US is yet another prime example how fragile the US system is. I mean, the world over we've all known and felt and, and rightly believe that US has the best health system in the world. Um, I mean, there is nothing to match the excellence that they have achieved in trying to see that no patient dies, no matter how serious the person is, but how fragile it turned out to be when uh, COVID struck. And uh, uh, despite having the best doctors and the latest technology and the huge amount of money that the government spends and so on. So that is amazing uh, and the most telling example of what happens when you build a health system with very uh, poor uh, foundations of primary care. So as a general comment, and they're definitely applicable and relevant to India, is the absence of community-based primary health care led by doctors well-trained in family medicine, infectious disease control and disease outbreak management are reasons for the inability to arrest the progression of COVID-19 particularly in India. So that's the kind of system we need to have. The perception of many is that the primary health care is cheap and therefore it might be poor in quality. So if you went with a, with a health system that affords and provides universal access only to primary care, it is more or less perceived in society as something that is uh, of low quality and it's, and it's for the poor alone. But the fact is that the primary care is far more complex, it's far more resource intensive, and far more valuable in terms of preventing disease and enhancing the quality of life. It encompasses intense preventive care to ensure the community is nutritionally healthy, protected from vaccine preventable diseases, and informed of the benefits of adopting healthy lifestyles. And at no other sector, you know, level of health is uh, so much of a focus on behavioral change and, uh, and bringing in preventive healthy lifestyles as a more sustainable model of being health, healthy and, and well on a long-term basis. It's just not a question of getting cured for a particular disease or an ailment that you're suffering at that moment. And this is because they do constant education, constant counseling, and there, is, uh, there are regular medical checkups in many of your countries. Every citizen has to get his medical checkup done every year and so on. Now, if those principles were 
uh, followed up and we two countries could also afford that that every citizen uh, gets his regular checkups it would go a long way in averting several for example cancers from you know being diagnosed too late in the stage so access to and then secondly primary care really does focus on social determinants and uh, and, uh, and the whole thing is a uh, so is anchored on the family doctor who is trusted by the family uh, that he serves because of the longitudinal uh, basis on which the doctor is related to the families in the community so all this requires setting up such a system really requires a lot of investment but the dividends are substantial now doctors respond to work opportunities in the marketplace there's no you no know, takers for doctors in the primary care no matter how uh, sound it is how cost effective it is as from a government's point of view from a public policy point of view but the doctor is an individual who is trying to maximize and optimize his own benefits and he he looks and responds to what is the what is it what is the marketplace kind of offering to me and the earnings the social status and the standard of life that can be provided to the families become very very motivating uh, determinants for these doctors when they make the choices or whether they want to become the physicians or they want to go into specialization now added to that is also particularly in hierarchically ridden structured societies like ours uh, a very high cultural and social value is attached to specialization and that again drives the medical the graduates to aspire to specialize more from very often driven by the social status that you know you are a specialist as a post to or you're just a generalist primary family doctor which is not doesn't entail the same status so by by um, you know commercializing medical education which we do in india the ability of the doctor however to choose has been heavily circumscribed right? when you have to pay a uh, three uh, crores that is say about 300 million rupees for a post graduate degree then you have borrowed the money or you sold your assets or or you done something so you are compelled by financial circumstances to want to do specialization and get into the more higher paying jobs in cities to earn back the capital that you invested so this is again a, a circle and a cycle that we need to get off and but it does them from going into kind of healthcare as is and uh, and you know as we also have a huge shortage of specialists so there is that market pull for the specializing and the specialists also and the market also rewards the specialists more so all these kind of pull push factors that the doctors when they entering into the career phase are uh, social um, you know economic and psychological pulls and pressures really drive these doctors to want to specialize more and that is really becoming a, a very major problem for primary care not getting the attention that it does and specialization continues to dominate uh, our the thinking now so the question that arises are around the definition of what in india what is being debated today is what's an ideal doctor who should it be and what is the nature of education and training that he must receive Uh, there is no right answer to this question and it's definitely different by the societal expectations aspirations and the disease burden every society has its own uh, aspirations of what they want what they want to see as a doctor once upon a time it was a yunani specialist or ayurvedic who was highly respected today he doesn't have any command any uh, attraction in society everybody wants a special an allopathy specialist so times change your aspirations change the uh, concept of an ideal doctor changes so what sort of incentives should health systems consider to make working as a generalist or a family doctor in a primary health care system the first choice so what what should public policy therefore do uh, fighting these uh, uh, you know uh, compelling circumstances what can government do to try and help the doctor way in for becoming a generalist rather than being pulled by these different forces to go into specialization how can we make primary care his first choice is monetary incentive an adequate uh, tool as uk 
before they say that a generalist earns as much if not more than a specialist or is providing career prospects and opportunities to study further and professionally develop a more compelling a factor that might drive doctors to make the choice to become a generalist. Given the rapid advancements in technology and artificial intelligence, what education reforms are required for creating the doctor of today and for 10 years hence? This is a very important research question that we need to answer. It's very well to say you must have a generalist working in the rural communities, but today increasingly society is being driven by technology and by concepts of artificial intelligence, personalized medicine, and so on and so forth. So the patients also and the people also are beginning to demand a certain standard and knowledge. So it's, it's, it's not possible to isolate a doctor to just give some TB tablets and, and do some minor treatment. So, so th these are all factors that we have to bring into our education system and it requires a rapid and uh, serious reform. Is it worth, as is happening, uh, creating specialization in primary care space, you know, post graduations in uh, family medicine, post graduation in infectious diseases, post graduate. So you, you narrow down the different aspects of primary care and make it into a specialist uh, mode. So that there is that element that I am specialist, but the primary care uh, has a similar uh, status as a specialist in a clinical discipline. So is that another way of trying to make primary care an, uh, an acceptable uh, uh, system uh, of choice? To challenge the current perceptions prevailing about a generalist versus a specialist, is it necessary to do research, for example, on uh, particularly for public policy changes to demonstrate how primary care has uh, been very effective in averting hospitalization, in averting heart cases, in averting, uh, you know, detection, early cancer, so that you avert mortality due to cancers. We have no such data in India, for example, and very few countries have done this hospital analysis of what is primary care. How has primary care really benefited uh, overall uh, in, in, uh, in improving quality of life and averting hospitalization, which is very, very costly. So these are research questions that, again, need to be raised, and they become and good sound research can be a very good advocacy tool for policymakers to change policy and weigh more for primary care than for hospitalization. So COVID now has thrown a challenge at us. We need to understand the issue of preparedness and ability to fight COVID in the context of how much of it could have been averted if only we had a sound primary care uh, where you know the quarantine, the, the detection of a of a person with, uh, with symptoms early enough. In the death. These are all highly decentralized. They don't need you to go to a hospital OPD to get these kind of um, responses for, for uh, uh, COVID diagnosis and treatment because many were asymptomatic. Many were treated at home uh, and so on. So, but then we became hospital centered largely because we didn't have adequate primary care uh, 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 you know, uh, frameworks. So that that needs to be our main argument, therefore, for making government and taking full advantage of the COVID pandemic to strengthen and uh, and really invest much more on primary care, because the amount of money they've spent on hospitals would have been saved if only we had a sound uh, primary health care system. So I would say that uh, that is the call, uh, public systems, public health surveillance systems, all these which come under the ambit of primary care is, uh, is what we need to learn from this COVID pandemic. And uh, let's hope that we don't let this opportunity uh, go by and we take full advantage of it to bring in a rational and a sensible and a sustainable health system in the world. So, uh questions proposed over there. Could I bring in Liz? Liz, could you come in, please, to begin with? And do you have any comments? And then we'll get Professor Srinivas from ESIC Medical College to sort of, you know, give his comments and his observations about what uh, Ms. Sujatha Rao has actually talked about over here. Well, first of all, just to say thank you so much for that extraordinary 
overview and I think it sets the tone of the rest of the conversation, how we take things forward, what we need to do to build on what has happened. And the words that came out of that for me were that um, actually words that Nigel Crisp, Lord Nigel Crisp has used, that health is made at home, hospitals are for repair. And primary health care, family doctors and primary health care can really support health being made at home. And I hope in the, our conversation going forward, we look at what are these research questions that we need to ask um, in order to provide the evidence of changing, creating this paradigm change that is necessary. I won't take time now, but because I, I think that it will be great to hear the, the rest of the panelists and then we can begin to um, explore in detail how we build together as a community um, on what has just been said. Um, so could I bring in Professor Srinivas, please? Professor Srinivas, we were having these conversations earlier on. Uh, Ms. Nathara talked about various barriers that have uh, emerged in the last so many years that prevent medical students from getting into this cultural mindset of becoming primary care doctors. We talked about, if you like, aspects of professionalization and um, issues such as a perception of academic failure if somebody goes into primary care. But anyway, could I draw in your experience and your comments about what has just been said? Thanks, Ali. Uh, it was very nice to hear to the madam again after a long time. When I was at All India Medical Sciences, she was the health secretary of the country. And uh, we had learned a lot of things from her being a, an able, great uh, health administrator. Uh, well, I can only say that, you know, uh, we are connecting Hyderabad now. You are from Hyderabad, Madam is at Hyderabad. I am at Hyderabad on deputation from Ames, New Delhi. And as you said that we need to break the barriers. You know, I think the best way to break the barrier is that, you know, uh, the COVID has made this uh, to open the eyes. You know, for example, uh, in my own case, I had COVID twice. And then it was a multi-system involvement. So I wish I was a journalist uh, where I know all the systems in place. And then uh, in my own experience, I could see that, you know, this is a time there where we will focus on the uh, going to the general medicine or family medicine rather than uh, organ-specific uh, tunnel vision uh, medicine. And uh, as I said, that uh, Madam said that our problems are there. And the biggest challenge in India, what the madam said is a status symbol. I think we need to break this barrier. If we can connect the Scotland and the Hyderabad, you know, we can have a collaborative uh, program of a family medicine that we can go ahead and then bring that status symbol. You know, there's a need, definitely there's a need. Then we have realized, especially with the COVID, we realized that we need to have a holistic approach and uh, the family medicine, the general medicine is more important than uh, this super specialized medicine care, especially with respect to the COVID care, which is happening in this country. And uh, if we look into the status symbol, well, I think uh, that is the one thing which will definitely be, the barriers will be broken once we uh, get these two great institutions from Scotland and over here, and then uh, get a collaborative research and then uh, the academic programs, wherein we can go uh, and have that, the need of the hour, which we have, you know, the need of the hour is that family medicine has to grow in this country. And for all the reasons which Madam has enumerated, I think we should look forward for uh, helping hand from the Scotland to Hyderabad. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much, Dr. Srinivas. I mean, I think it would be fair to bring in Mr. Mushtaba Askari, who is the founder of a non-governmental organization called Helping Hands Foundation. They have uh, been mobilizing resources towards generating primary care. Mushtaba, could you please come in at this point? And what I'd like to ask you is what would your appeal be and what is your perspective in terms of, you know, how primary care needs to be uh, enabled, if you like, with good medical education? So could you please come in here, Mr. Mushtaba? Yeah. Uh, Ali, I think, uh, first of all, uh, taking the thread uh, out of what uh, Madam Suyatara was just uh, mentioned, uh, primary care in the context of COVID, uh, and especially in the context of uh, uh, Telangana from where uh, we work, where we live, uh, has lived up to a lot of expectations. Uh, I would like to basically uh, share one of my experiences through a project uh, which we did with the Azim Premji Foundation and another local NGO, where the primary health care systems, the PHCs, um, uh, played a major role in control uh, and um, 
management of covid uh, uh, in in uh, in hyderabad and the surrounding areas so um, in this model in that particular model uh, what we saw was that uh, the field level surveillance uh, was brought in by the asha workers uh, and uh, then we had a triaging system within the phc and then uh, we had the helping hand foundation which provided a layer of online consultation so a combination of these three um, uh, layers of service uh, played a major role the field surveillance by asha workers the triaging at the phc and then the additional online layer of you know uh, medical consultation uh, by us helped us uh, uh, treat almost close to about 5000 patients with very good outcomes so uh, that model uh, which we saw uh, during the covid worked well and as madam pointed out that needs further strengthening now another important point uh, which i uh, could relate to Uh, from um, uh, Mr. Sujata Rao's speech is the community level engagement through the PHC, and that's again an area where my organization, uh, as you know, uh, we work in the primary health care. We've got our own PHCs uh, which we run uh, in the city. Uh, we are trying, uh, are making efforts, uh, concerted efforts, uh, to bring in the community level screening uh, vis a vis uh, screening for non communicable diseases, screening for um you know, liver diseases and then we are also doing screening for cancer uh, oral potentially malignant disorders so this i believe is very very significant with pandemic or without pandemic the primary care system its ability to preempt morbidities is something which will be there and the need is greater uh, at this moment so that uh, the uh, benefit of this is passed on to the uh patients especially from the vulnerable sections so that is what i had to say um ali okay could i just again draw upon your experience i remember having a discussion with you about the inequities the bare inequities that you saw um because of the covid-19 pandemic and how you felt that a stronger primary care system could have addressed those inequities you know social determinants that sujatha rao talks about and liz talks about quite a lot um how could that have been better i mean what what did you actually see where could good primary care have had made the difference yeah as we all saw during the pandemic especially during the months of july to september when the pandemic was at the peak uh there were there was a very typical situation as far as we were concerned uh, at one hand we had the uh, corporate and the private uh, establishments which were treating patients for covid but they were out of reach for the common man because of they were exorbitantly priced and on the other hand we had the public health system Uh, which had all the capability but there were shortcomings and the trust factor the trust deficit among the common man with the public system was low and uh, what we found was that uh, interim uh, a middle part to that was that uh, organizations like us social organizations like us played a important role in delivering primary care at the doorstep now as i mentioned the other day and uh, with the uh, university of edinburgh panel which we had discussions on inequities uh, basically what we did was that uh, we brought in we brought in basic primary health care services at the doorsteps for the covid uh, patients uh, supply of oxygen getting the labs at the doorstep supplying medicines and then we had the doctor consultation layer uh, online so this worked well this worked well and uh, i'm 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 proud to say that at least about close to 5000 patients and out of which almost 95 to 96% of the patients recovered and benefited from this kind of a service fantastic thank you very much um, what i'll do now ask i don't know if dr konappa is on this call dr konappa if you're on this call could you please uh, put your camera on so that we can see you right okay so he's not here but what i'll do very quickly then is ask professor chaku to come in and give the experience that from kerala um on um the, the covid situation and with regards to where primary care uh, played a major role and where it would probably have played a major role if the capacity was there so professor chaku greetings from kerala believers church medical college um 
Kerala has been in the forefront of health uh, professions education as well as in healthcare system delivery through its well uh, developed and uh, almost machine like uh, efficient primary care system and doctors. And they have gone in a systematic way approaching the pandemic. And the success story is because of the primary care doctors and um, the doctors were, uh, in the government sector. Mostly the government sector was involved in the COVID care management. So it went very well. And uh, uh, as a result of this, uh, the mo mortality has been the least, I can even say, in the world. So very few deaths um, compared to the large number of cases that did happen. Professor Chattu, tell me, how has Kerala approached, if you like, the model of enabling primary care through its medical education system? Where has been this, I would say it's a cultural success. How have, has Kerala managed the cultural success of primary care as against some parts of the world which haven't managed the same degree of success? So it's mainly because of the political commitment and the health system was ready. Um, it had earlier uh, fought other um, infectious diseases very systematically and uh, in a scientific way. The Nipah outbreak was contained and the, the, in the state, the system was ready. And so because the system being ready and having uh, learned its lessons, uh, it uh, knew its strength of decentralized planning uh, from uh, bottom up. Uh, the local self-government is very strong in Kerala. And uh, once the direction is given, the policy direction is given by the state government, uh, then the machinery is there at the grassroots levels. Even the neighbors keep watch on you. And they are the surveillance mechanism uh, at the um, community level. And there is support from uh, them, and that has led to the success. So primary care truly, uh, at the first contact level, began with the neighbors. And of course, the um, volunteers called ASHA workers and other functionaries of the government, they are all in place, and like a well-oiled machinery. I think you know, um, it might be relevant to sort of ask what is the cultural mindset of a medical student in Kerala? When you've got you know, a system that has been enabled through policy and you've got, if you like, a strong sense of community, um, a typical medical student, do they aspire to become a specialist or is there a strong move towards going into primary care? Um, what's the sort of, you know, the status of the primary care doctor in Kerala? Oh, in, uh, uh, like in the rest of the country, um, um, as somebody had earlier mentioned, I, I think you mentioned that uh, during earlier times, the primary care doctor was the god. Now, uh, even, the same, the, even though the same traditional education system continues, um, the faith in the MBBS doctor's ability to manage a case has come down. And uh, the focus is on the specialists. Even the patients, they go to the specialists. Uh, and because of that, the undergraduate doctors, MBBS people, they don't stop at being just basic doctors. They all want to be specialists. And so that's the problem that needs to be uh, addressed. So eventually there's a threat. So in terms of, you know, Framing of the medical curriculum, what has been done? I, I'd like to bring Professor Chalam as well into this conversation. So Professor Chaku, first to you, what has been done from a medical curriculum perspective at NMC level to address this? And do you sincerely believe that an MBBS doctor has the ability to be an effective primary care doctor or it takes a little bit more experience? Yeah, the policy at the uh, national level, the policy has been to so switch over kind of transition from the traditional medical education to competency-based medical education. Uh, what, what progress has been made is um, 
continue with the discipline based education but the there is a clear documentation of the outcomes um, what qualities the doctors must uh, the graduates must be able to do that has been listed and documented and now the pressure is on the system the educational system to deliver on that so that is there uh, a lot needs to be done uh, because the bottom line is um, are they competent are they job ready so that question needs to be addressed professor could you please come in and then we'll bring liz after this oh, oh am i uh, yes, am i yes. asked to speak yes we can hear you sir okay sir sir the first question is regarding the curriculum see if we see the curriculum in the goals itself in the goals of the curriculum it is mentioned that undergraduate should possess the knowledge which to function appropriately and effectively of physician of first contact and uh, if you see into the content it is clearly mentioned that the focus while we are teaching should be on common diseases and if you go through the document clear carefully at every stage it is mentioned that it is the common diseases and the cases which he see in his future job should be highlighted even if you see the examination methodology if you read the curriculum in exam methodology it is clearly mentioned please test the competencies in the common cases don't test the competencies of the rare cases or syndromes has to be discouraged only common cases has to be tested so so what is written here is clearly about the physician of first contact right but what happens on the ground when we gra we graduate a medical indian medical graduate are we stopping him there are we encouraging him to go for sub specialization there are multifactorial things here see if 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 i say that i have done mbbs and uh, if you see about 50 years back or 100 years back everyone is satisfied and uh, used to practice it but today we have created such a situation the poor fellow the poor indian medical graduate even myself i have come out of the college poor indian medical graduate now i am at the crossroad and socio economic and societal situation is such that they force me to go into a specialization we have created a society like that we have created a market like that so what is my market value so that will be the my first question what is the society value so we ourselves have created a society in which we are forcing a indian medical graduate who comes out of the college to go into specialization not to go for a physician of first contact so we have to create such a atmosphere that we should the indian medical graduate should feel happy that he is the physician of first contact and he should be able to practice because he has always aims of going into aiming into a specialization he is neglecting is the competencies of the primary physician so this is this is multifactorial you know we only have created a situation where we ask for specialized specializations the poor fellow he cannot stop there he is forced by his relatives friends society to do specialization so i feel as far as the curriculum is called curriculum is well planned well planned for indian medical graduate to be physician of first contact that is very clearly mentioned but only thing is we should follow the curriculum who has to follow curriculum the teachers have to follow curriculum the students have to follow curriculum the society has to create a such an atmosphere that you should follow the curriculum one side we are ask, retain the competencies like physician of first contact the other side we are asking for what specialization you will do what specialization you will do so we are putting that the, the student into a dilemma what to do so i feel this is multifactorial we have to correct that in every stage but what is written in curriculum wonderful it is for physician of first contact Cultural barriers. You mentioned financial barriers. Do you think it's upon it's it's incumbent upon the educators to sort of promote um, the cultural idea that 
being a primary care physician is a good thing? I mean, what advice would you have for medical educators from a curriculum point of view and from, you know, sort of putting forward the hidden curriculum? See, my advice for all the educators is that just we need the curriculum is very well written from right from the first sentence in the curriculum, which mentions about the goals of Indian medical graduate. It is mentioned that you should be physician of first contact. In letter and spirit, we should implement it. In the letter and spirit, we should implement it. But the immediate question is, is the recipient ready to receive it? That is the student. See, he should have a confidence that he will be a competent physician of first contact. But today, we have created such a situation that he is forced again not to be there. So that is the situation. But as far as educators are concerned, we all should educate the student and tell them it is the foundation. First, let the foundation be good. After you have this foundation, you can aim for higher. So we, that's what, that is a lot of effort on the part of the, the authorities to establish this because earlier, what happens in the undergraduation while doing internship, we call house surgency. During internship, everyone is to concentrate only on postgraduate entrance examination and not to attend any internship program or does not learn any skills in internship because he has to appear for postgrad. Now there is a plan which uh, puts into place an exit examination at the end of final year exam, final year. So that exam will be over and on the basis of those marks, you will be given a post-graduation seat. So, Next one year during internship, the whole time he has only to concentrate and learn the competencies which are required to be a physician for first contact. So he need not be deviated for the sake of post-graduation. That is a very good measure which has been started. I, I, if I can come in here, I, I think that's it's so important. You're picking up such an, a, a, a critical area where we need quite a radical change and a change that not just um, that, a change that medical educators can't bring about themselves um, alone because you've identified that this is also a societal change. This is turning around the message of the primary in primary health care and family medicine. And, and I feel that from, from each of the um, discursants so far, there is this you know, this real message that primary has become something um, initial, something that the children do, something that's the first point, but therefore, but there's something greater beyond the primary. And yet, I think COVID, ha ha this pandemic has shown us that, that actually the primary health care is the pinnacle. And it is the if I can say the specialism of all specialisms, it brings together everything. It, it again, it enables health to be created as opposed to be repaired in, um, in the hospitals. I wonder, could I bring in Dr. Mansoor from Bangladesh to get um, your perspective, Mansoor, on the, the work that you're doing and in, in a sense that training that's necessary and that paradigm shift that we're looking for within medical colleges but within society and how doctors in society can be, become this um, the, the, the mouth of the, this change that we need because we know in our hearts what we need. Dr. Mansur, you. are you available? Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz, for the nice question. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, actually, uh, Bangladesh is uh, just staying at, uh, at the geographically, it is the eastern part of India. It, uh, all the, there are so many similarities with the eastern provinces of India with Bangladesh. But Bangladesh is densely populated than any other countries. And we have a lot of population, and mainly our health service are at the hand of primary care physicians. But unfortunately, uh, unlike the developed countries in our medicine uh, discipline, there is only three faculties. One is surgery, medicine, and gynae. There is no primary care or family medicine faculty in our medical universities or in our curriculum. And that's why uh, we are lacking a trained, family physician or generalist. We are having a lot of specialists. 
but most of the people, more than 80 to 90 percent people, are served by the primary care physicians who are not well equipped. Fortunately, we, the Bangladesh Primary Care Respiratory Physicians, a professional organization, we developed that is uh, privately, it is not the under the governance of government or leadership of government. We developed a professional group and we are training the physicians, those, are, those who are interested in respiratory medicine, a primary care respiratory group. We are conducting some um, uh, uh, training courses and uh, IPCRG, you know, International Primary Care Respiratory Group is helping us a lot. Even University of Edinburgh, uh, under their project of Respira, they help us, we have a collaboration with them. They help, uh, they are helping us to improve the capacity building of the primary care respiratory uh, doctors. So I think uh, this global academy uh, can help a lot to improve the respiratory uh, care, or, or not only respiratory care, primary care, and to set up a primary care or family medicine faculty in our medicine discipline. Because our doctors are all getting training from the hospitals, not from the community. They are not coming to the community. Yes, during their internship, they are coming to community one or two months, but that is not a guided teaching. And by two months, you can learn, you can't learn a lot. You have to work. We are, personally, I am Dr. Roshan is here. We are working 30 years, 40 years in uh, the primary care setting. We know the pulse of the people and how to deal with the people in the primary care setting. This is not, hospital experience will not work here. So I think we should uh, arrange a system by which the GP, like UK, GPs will train the primary care physician for a long time and then they will be certified as uh, GP or then they, they will have a profile. Uh, then they can get, get best service and their profile will be enriched Otherwise, people will uh, look at the, some of our uh, panel members too. People will go to the specialist. They will be more oriented to the specialist. I think this this all from me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. That. There's so much more I know that you could say as well. It's such an important message about turning this around. And perhaps I can bring in um, a, a couple more perspectives and then um, begin to uh, um, get some of the questions from the chat as well. But if, if I could ask Dr. Abathithan from Iraq and also Dr. Bandari from, from Nepal, if they could both reflect actually on what Mansoor said about the training and about the need of change and what we've heard um, so far. Uh, Dr. Abathithan, are you uh, on the call? Yes, your co-host, uh, Dr. Abathithan, please come in. Dr. Bhandari, you are a co-host as well. You can come in. Uh, thank you, Lich. Uh, thank you, Ali. So basically in Nepal, what we have is two stream. Uh, we have a GP stream uh, and we have also this uh, community medicine stream. Uh, in Nepal, 1978 is the first uh, year where medical education started. The MBBS student started to produce in Nepal. Uh, and then in 1983, we have a collaboration with the University of Calgary in, Cal in Canada. So we started the first GP program in Nepal. So we have a long history with the GP program in Nepal. So we have been working with the primary healthcare uh, since then because our medical uh, admission was actually from the health professional background, not from the science background. We actually deliberately took on health students in the MBBS course in the 1978 because they were more uh, working with the people at the time, you know, so with the experience. So government, what they have done is, so in 1994, the radical medical education change happened. And then we have started to see the prolification of the medical colleges in Nepal uh, with the introduction of first me private medical college in Nepal with the Manipal group coming to Nepal and starting their education in Nepal. And uh, in 2001, 2003, what happened is in Patan Hospital, which was a missionary hospital at that time, uh, the missionary said that we are leaving. So then we were working there and then we said, 
okay, what should be done? Because the political insurgency was there. People were feeling very desperate, the no education, no healthcare. So we ourselves, we decided that we have to do something for Nepal because health is one area where people always look, no? So, so then we started to think about a medical school which uh, slowly started as a dream of university. So we ultimately were able to get a deemed university status in 2008. And 2010, we started our medical course. The, uh, the basic uh, groundwork was there to seven years of work was there. We said 25% of our course will be primary care. We wanted our student to learn in the community, not in the hospital. We said clearly, if you want to send your student in the community, train them in the community. Don't train them in the hospital. That is what we did. And in 2016, when our first batch, they went in the community, because uh, in Nepal, what happens if you have a scholarship, you have to have, you have to go and work in the, uh, in the district designated by the Ministry of Health. So 2016, 17, 18, and 20, students actually started working in the community and they were sending such a powerful reflective messages to us. Thank you because you train us in the community. Please do so, continue doing that because this is the way to do that. No? So I think that is where medical education should be focused. Okay, Rather than training them in the hospital, train them in the community so that they feel ease when they go and they work in the community, they feel at home because they have been there. They know the situation. They know the hardship, they know the problem. And you equip them with the training, what should you do? How should you work on that situation? So in 2020 is when COVID broke out, uh, our student, medical student arranged a webinar, invited our, uh, our student who were working in the different part of the community and they provided the let's say they, they provided their uh, experience, their know-how, how to deal with the situation. And all of our, I, I am very happy, all medical students from all over Nepal who were working in all over Nepal, they were very happy, but I feel like the students very really trained them in the community. And I think my personal opinion is that go in the community, train them in, learn with the community, in our uh, program, actually our students are uh, assessed by the community. Okay, their behavior are assessed, their attitudes are assessed, and students know because they are constantly in the like in, in the watchful eye of the community. So I think if we can do that, you know, that is one thing. Uh, so now, another thing that is that has happened very good in Nepal is that uh, the government has also started to provide the scholarship for the postgraduate student. Madam was telling uh, earlier say that 300 crore rupees has to be paid. So in Nepal, what we did was, if you have a scholarship, then you have to go back and talk, solve the committee. It's like the social responsibility, no? So about two weeks back, our first PG batch has graduated and we were able to send a group of six specialist PG students in a district where our students are posted. So they are going there as a group, medicine, surgery, obstetrics, pediatrics, uh, even GP and everybody, six in each state, we are sending them. I think that is a powerful message. If that is happening in Patan, I think that is happening in every other medical college in Nepal. And I can see a very bright future of primary healthcare in Nepal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, that was tremendous to hear that the information from Nepal and from Bangladesh, just to, to um, and, and India, just thinking about where together um, as a global, you know, we're global and we're local and how national um, situations are changing, but how we can learn together to bring about even additional changes in that sense of partnership. I wonder um, if I could uh, um, ask actually, um, is, is, is Dr. Abith uh, Thien um, here, here at the minute? Yes, yes. yes. Lovely. Um, I wonder Hi. if I could bring you in as well. Okay, you hear me well, my voice is clear. Very clear, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Ali Majid. Uh, salam to all, my best wishes to all and uh, greetings. Uh, I am very uh, happy to be here with you. Uh, uh, I hear a lot of talking, a, a real uh, important notes uh, raised by many colleagues from different areas of the world. Uh, we've, uh, we are discussing the same issue, we're facing many uh, similar similarities in, in developing the practice of family medicine or GP or 
uh, primary healthcare or whatever it's it's uh, 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 defined uh, according to the health system. In Iraq, actually, uh, family medicine is not new and not old. Uh, as a practice, as a, a, a speciality, it started in late 90s, but it's start to maybe 10, 12 years ago, they start to hear of it. There is an, uh, a tendency to, uh, to, en to enroll in family medicine, and there is a will from Ministry of Health uh, to increase uh, the number and the uh, capacity of family medicine within primary health care and within the health system. Also, this is supported by the WHO. Uh, but uh, till now, we have many, many difficulties, many uh, weakness, or how we develop, uh, same as what the uh, colleagues uh, mentioned. We need, it's, it's, I don't know, some said that it's, uh, it's, it's not a specialty. Uh, maybe they do not have a specialty of family medicine or GP or something, but in Iraq, uh, it is a specialty, but could be defined sometimes, uh, described by some colleagues as second rank specialty might be this considered by some. Unfortunately, this, this is true many times. So we need to put uh, a criteria for it, uh, and, and increase the, the, the position, the sub, uh, we need to need support the, 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 the position, the work of family physician uh, and, uh, as a real uh, specialty, uh, including that starting from the medical college, from the medical school to change curriculum and to increase the, the training in, at the community site, at the primary healthcare center within the curriculum, even within the old curriculum or the new uh, model of curriculum. We need to develop the training from early uh, in the medical schools, then after that. Also an important note, I think it's, it's, it, it's we need in the medical college and the training in the undergraduate and postgraduate, we need a specialist other specialists who are oriented to primary health care and oriented for family medicine. We, we miss that in Iraq. They do not know what is the really function or what is the role of primary health care or, uh, or, or, or family medicine. Only minority will know who know or really consider and the, they, they know how important the role of primary health care in the health system and the uh, service delivery for people. Uh, so we, we, we need also to, to, to raise awareness of other specialties in the, issue, in the field of primary health care. I know many specialists, they have no idea because they ha on, on primary health care because they already do not train or do not mention anything with or five or year, five or t four or five years in training such as in medicine, general, internal medicine or pediatrics. They have no idea or not any si simple issue regarding primary health care. And this is a problem also. So we need uh, other specialists to be oriented. Now WHO support uh, family medicine. WHO want to increase the number of general practice. Uh, or we want to bridge all gener generalists to be family physicians, uh, to reach the sustainable developmental goals and the universal health coverage. This is an, an opportunity for us, actually. But uh, and uh, we, we start many programs to increase the uh, how to, uh, to, to bring the generals to be family physicians, to be trained in family physicians. And we have some success in, in many programs. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have already Arab board and Iraqi board, which is four year based training. We have diplomas for two years and we now started a one year uh, diploma just to bridge those generals. It's, it's have some benefits uh, also, but we need uh, an important issue, and uh, I, I want to, to highlight this at least to be considered. I think we cannot uh, develop uh, family medicine, primary health care, general practice, or whatever, without a, a solid health system. We need to develop the health system within the country that support the primary health care worker, the general practice, the family physician who work. Now, uh, in Iraq, the, the health system uh, is, is shifted toward the, the hospitals. Other specialties are in bigger, uh, much bigger number than those who work in primary health care. So we need, uh, we have now, uh, uh, we have a good number, increasing numbers of uh, family physicians, but uh, with uh, no real role in the health system, with limited resources, with limited area of work. So we need to develop the health system to, to, to support the primary health care and family medicine, and that also to develop the people, as the colleagues said, and toward the person-centered 
care. This, this issue, well, we, we cannot work alone to develop a family physician with, with an old out of date uh, health system that totally uh, support the, the hospitals. Thank you so much. I think that is, is also so important and you brought in a lot there, a lot that um, we, we are hearing reflected in all the conversations. This needs to be a whole systems approach, but a system approach also not just with, actually not just in the medical and health sector, but in the economic awesome. sector, in the development sector, in the sector that involves transport, because actually we're coming to the big question of planetary health, that sense that our health, we everyone needs to feel they belong and have a part to play. But you, but and as you talked about the sustainable development goals and and the um, ambition for universal health coverage, um, and WHO's call, it is clear family medicine and primary strength and primary care, and a strength and primary care system within the whole system is essential. I wonder, can I turn and bring in um, Dr. Angus Grant, um, a, a general practitioner, a family medicine doctor here actually practicing in Scotland, because I see Angus, you, you're commenting that, that the key of, of actually ensuring training happens in community is absolutely essential in, in also in getting this paradigm shift together. So Angus, I, if you're able to come on the call, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I think I've unmuted myself and hopefully I'm still here. No, it's been a, it's been a fascinating discussion and I've enjoyed hearing all the inputs from different places. Um, and I am I was very struck by the, the theme coming through of education being very specialist orientated. Um, and I think that's certainly been our experience, you know, in the UK and we're, we're having to sort of, or have had to relearn, um, you know, that if you want to train people for, the, for a particular role in primary care, uh, then you need to train them in that place, um, be that undergraduate or postgraduate. Um, and I think that's something that our system has had to had to learn. Um, uh, you know, and I think you know, I guess that's the the main point I would want to make. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, Angus, as well about the um, where you see family medicine general practice in the UK going um, in the future? And where, when we think about the global partnerships, what do, um, you've alluded to this already, but what do we need to learn in the UK as we, think, as we strengthen um, family medicine? Um, I think in the UK we need to learn, and we are learning, uh, working as part of teams. We've had a very, in a sense we've been, quite fortunate in having lots of doctors in primary care um, you know working at the front line but I think we are recognizing that we have to work more as part of teams with other members in the team um, you know whether that's nurses um, you know community health workers pharmacists whoever we're having to work in larger teams and I think that's a good experience because everyone brings their own strengths in and um, I think we also have to learn that we are only a small part of, if you want to really improve health, in a sense, the medical world only does a little part of it, you know, and it's, it's also by looking at the changes in the, in the planet that need to be made to, um, you know, try and reverse or limit climate change, for example, that's going to make the biggest difference to, bigger difference to health than uh, you know probably anything I will do in my entire working career so these are the we need to have a look at the bigger picture and see what we can do to influence in our spheres of work um, you know both locally and you know internationally we need to be a little bit political in, a se in that sense political in the with a small p yeah uh, thank you and, and I think this is where medical education in its transformation um, post-COVID, and we're not post-COVID, obviously, at the minute, but we will be someday, um, pray God. So we need to be thinking now, what are the changes that we can see uh, that we could bring about that would influence um, the medical education system, influence the health system? And again, coming back to what I said at the beginning and what was being so eloquently said by so many, 
influence those other systems because um, the medical practitioner has a, a, an extraordinary voice, a voice that can, if, if strengthened in community and, can, and working with community can really begin to bring about change. I would like to bring in Neil here, at, um, Professor Neil Turner, just to reflect on what's been, been said. Um, is that okay? Liz, thank you very much. So um, I'm a super specialist. I'm a nephrologist, you know, working in a, in a very expensive specialty, but I've also been in, in, in charge of the medical curriculum for a, a good long spell. And now I oversee what happens to vets and biomedical scientists too, which helps give a bit of perspective, nearly as much perspective as you get by listening to uh, this kind of occasion with a fantastic range of experience in, in different political, economic, uh, and just world situation environments. Um, and the, the UK, though, is, is a, a country which is known internationally for having a, 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 very, um, a very big focus on primary care, uh, probably since the NHS was set up. Um, it had a royal college, I think, almost uh, 70 years ago, now um, and the first the world's first professor of university professor of general practice almost 60 years ago now which was in edinburgh um, but many of the problems you've described are extraordinarily familiar um, so we do have a better um, primary care system politically set up well supported financially although we want it better um, and i just want to put a, a a super specialist's perspective on it. So uh, it's very, very expensive to train, accommodate and run uh, a nephrology service with its dialysis and its transplantation. My time is not well spent adjusting the dose of blood pressure drugs every month or two in patients who have to travel a very long way to get to me. I am actually completely dependent on that kind of management being undertaken in, in primary care. So that I can say this patient needs very good blood pressure control, please could you help us to achieve it? And the team in general practice will take the blood pressure, look at the drugs, adjust them, speak to the patient about the side effects. And then when they come back to me, you can have a look at the another, you know, another six months ahead and not, not, not be focused on the the, the details of care which thousands of patients would need to come to us if we were to achieve that in the, out in the community. Um, of course, nephrology is also a specialty with very longitudinal care of patients. So it is, um, it, it is one where you see the patient as children to adults and in some inherited diseases, you see their family members as well. So it's kind of easy for us to understand how very important that is to getting the patient to buy into their care, to take their tablets, to want to keep them coming back, to learn to trust their healthcare team. Um, so it's absolutely no challenge to me to see how important it is that we inculcate this in our trainees and that we value it politically. Um, and I just want to say a little bit about the direction in the UK because I think it's the same everywhere. The direction in the UK is that we have far fewer acute beds in hospitals than we used to have. Hospital stays are much shorter, and yet we have far more medical students. So even if you didn't believe in the importance of sending students to primary care, and I do, you have to use primary care more because that's where the patients are. The things which used to happen in secondary care should be happening in primary care, and we hope they will increasingly. The Scottish government has actually set us a target. I think the Scottish average of training time in primary care, which I think is higher than a lot of other countries, is about 11 to 12 percent. That's the proportion of their time, which is a medical student's time that's spent in primary care, being taught by primary care practitioners. And, um, you know, we're, we've done other things, too. We, we've, we've had primary care practitioners running our final year medical students for a large fraction of the last um, couple of decades, actually. Um, the Scottish government wants to double that. 
Now that does create all sorts of challenges for people like Angus, whose facilities uh, don't necessarily have space for twice the number of undergraduates, let alone in a time when we're very anxious about transmitting infection. So we have some really big challenges in getting to the place we want to be. And a number of the other um, really important priorities that we've heard about today, and it was, it was so good to hear them reflected from different countries, the politics. The country has to want to do this. In, in a way, you could solve the problem in a decade by paying primary care practitioners as much as a specialist cardiologist works. Now that earns, now that's probably not achievable, but there are other ways of making people choose a career in primary care. Finance is a really important part of it, not as straightforward as I just suggested. Um, curriculum and training. Thank you very much, Professor Chalam, for outlining really important changes in the, in the curriculum. But unless they're politically supported, and unless we believe in them as medical teachers, that it, won't, it won't on its own be quite enough. It's really important that it sets the ground because without it, you will not have the graduates able to do the job. Um, and primary care only works if you have good graduates doing it. Um, and then the last thing is this question of attitude. Um, our students see specialism in many, and, and it's not absent as a problem in the UK, but just less than in many countries. Uh, many, many students don't see um, primary care as the career they want to do, and we need to fix that. And we need to stop our colleagues from belittling people who've chosen primary care too, because there's been a long tradition of jokes about a few specialties. Um, one of them is primary care, another is psychiatry, and the third, Ali, is orthopedics. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it is. Uh, so a lot, a, a lot of things to fix, a good few of which we have a handle on, but we absolutely have to have the politics right too. Um, Professor Srinivas very kindly mentioned the um, collaboration with Edinburgh that we're trying to set up, which is about, from, from a country with a, a strong tradition of education and training in primary care, trying to see whether there are things which we can jointly do to help upskill new graduates or retrain old graduates who aren't in a, in a specialty in countries that have a real need to expand quickly and therefore probably not the training capacity yet. I, I, I don't need to go into the details of it, I don't think at this point, but I think it's, it, it's so good to hear how much it is needed um, and, and wanted, because it has to be both. But thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. I'd just like to ask you, and perhaps we could go around the panel and ask this very personal question. How do we get that sort of cultural shift about primary care being, if you like, being accepted as a model of uh, a model that medical students should aspire to that how did how does one promote that sort of cultural shift so we'll start with you and then we'll go around the panel and perhaps even ask the panel to suggest what would be the next step what would they suggest should be the next step to promote primary care yeah. I, I, ali i'll just very quickly say um when i speak to our, our students in edinburgh where I think 30% of also of students go directly into primary care, but actually in the long run, quite a lot more move in later. Um, it's not talked about very much in hospital as a career. And yet if you speak to the students on their own, quite a lot of them, despite the uh, um, sometimes adverse environment uh, for, for talking about it in, in hospitals, quite a lot of them actually want to go there. I think uh, there's probably hidden opportunities here. Um, if we can just do work on all of the three main areas I said, I think we'd be pushing at an open door, but it starts with political will to make general practice, primary care, a, a, an attractive opportunity. Who lobbies the politicians? Should it be the medical establishment? Um, particularly at a grassroots level led by the medical educators? Yeah, well, it would be lovely if the medical educators did lead the medical establishment. That's not the reality. It tends to be the specialist societies. 
right? And do you think the specialist societies are actually pushing for specialization because of the incentive of research monies that actually, um, if you like, sustain a lot of academic research posts? I think it's more complex than that. Um, I think there's a tendency for any profession to try to protect it, and that applies to branches of a profession too. So I think what we need to do is make sure that the primary care colleges are as influential as the specialist society colleges. Fantastic. Angus, do you have anything to say about that from a UK perspective, about how exactly would one shift the cultural mindset of students to take on primary care practice? Uh, I don't know. I was in the very fortunate system of um, graduating and coming into a system where primary care was, as Neil has said, uh, well established and well recognised. Um, I would agree with him that just paying people lots of money is not the entire answer. Um, uh, I think it is about, and I, I appreciate the points about having systems as well, having good systems where that, where you have a place for primary care physicians and primary care teams. Um, I think it's lots of little steps coming from all sides. I think political will, uh, I would agree with Neil, is very important. Um, and and big and here political with a capital P. You know, if you get politicians on board to say primary care is the way ahead, we want to do it, um, then it will happen. You need to have the systems in place. Um, I think it, we're very good at complaining. Um, perhaps I'm speaking very much from a UK perspective. We're always complaining about how hard the job is, and I think that sometimes puts people off. Uh, we need to say what a great job it is, um, and how. Yeah, it has its challenges, but how much we enjoy doing it and, and what the rewards we get from it. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, to that end, you know, I'm very, we're, I'm very fortunate in being in a teaching and training practice. And we try to make our medical students' experience as good as possible. Um, so I think that's a big factor also. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, but yeah, but yeah that's, those are my thoughts, Ali. Joined by, thank you, Angus. I see we've been joined by Ms. Gata Rao. Um, so she's uh, reached Delhi safely. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining. I think we've lost you. Um, oh. oh, no, we're there. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, uh, Mr. Jata Rao. Could you come in? We've been having a discussion about changing the cultural mindset of students uh, towards joining into primary care. And I know that you talked about very compellingly the professional, cultural, financial, and regulatory barriers. Do you see with the COVID-19 pandemic, the embracing of technology as a way forward in promoting primary care and the attractiveness of primary care? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, because, uh, you know, the technology is a great enabler in being able to provide better quality of care better diagnosis and so on. So now with technology, which has so many uh, point of view, uh, you know, use uh, decentralized systems don't, which do these tests enable a doctor to be much more efficient in his uh, uh, diagnostics and uh, being able to uh, help the patient in a qualitatively better way. I think overall, the attraction to, towards uh, primary care will increase. Uh, because in low resource settings like India, without technology, without access to drugs, without the capability to really help a patient improve his uh, quality of life, has been one has been found to be one of the major deterrents for doctors to want to take to primary care. So I think once the uh, uh, you know he has access to technologies and to uh, um, other means of being able to quickly diagnose and do provide quality treatment, it will certainly help uh, upgrade or shall I say enhance the overall working experience and also the prestige of the primary care doctor, which is very important in a way. Thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Dr. Rao, uh, shortly, but uh, could I go around the panel again? Professor Srinivas, would you like to come in again? And after that, we'll bring Mr. Mushtaba Askari about observations on this session, followed by Professor Chalam and Professor Chakur.
So first, uh, we've got Professor Srinivas. Any comments, Professor Srinivas? Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. I think uh, we have been discussing about the problems which we have in different parts of the world. And you being in India, you know, look at the Nepal. They could do it and why India cannot do it, you know. That's what is the question which arises in our minds here. And it's a time that we sit together and then especially with the COVID where we have understood that uh, there is a multi-speciality involvement and that we need to train the people for the family medicine and the general medicine. Uh, I think uh, we need to go ahead and then go for the international collaborations. As Madam said, that uh, we need to increase that uh, status symbol, you know, and the need for this is uh, that we need to have a family physician. I think from the ESAC Medical College at Hyderabad, uh, I have already spoken to the uh, Professor Neil Turner that we need to bring that uh, particular academic program wherein we can say that, well, India and UK together, uh, we are going to uh, go back to the roots like what we had before, that uh, the primary physician is most important. And that will give the name and the fame and the, the money and everything. You know, people have been speaking about that it's a status symbol uh, and uh, which is not there tagged to the family physician. Let us get back that family, the status symbol to the family physician for the best of our, uh, uh, you know, services to the mankind. Thank you, Ali. Um, Mustafa, what's your perspective? You know, you've heard, you've listened to the discussion, and how do you think the movement for primary care should be pushed forward at a sort of grassroots level, like your level uh, from an NGO? And what would you expect? How do you expect the medical community to respond to that? Yeah, Ali, that what would you like? Yeah, Ali, there are two things uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned because I'm a non-medical professional in this group. Uh, one thing which is important in the context of India is that the government plays a very vital role uh, in terms of providing resources for the primary health care system. So uh, there has to be uh, a commitment or an increased uh, focus, especially after the pandemic, uh, on the primary health care system and the government needs to step up its, its resources on the system. Uh, that's very important. Number two, as far as the culture is concerned, the med medical education is concerned, the graduates are concerned, that needs a mindset shift. Uh, the doctors need to see value uh, uh, as a family uh, medical practitioner. That is presently missing in the uh, Indian context. Uh, as uh, the other uh, learned colleagues have been pointing out, super speciality and post-graduation is a very common thread and aspiration among most doctors who graduate. So unless that value proposition is brought up, unless the doctors see that value, uh, this, uh, the, the ground level situation will not change in the near future. Uh, that's my take, uh, Ali, on that. Fantastic. We'll bring in Professor Chako before we bring in Professor Chalam. Professor Chako, you've listened through the discussion. Any observations and how do you respond to Mr. Askari, Mr. Mushtaba? Uh, excellent ideas have come through this panel and they are based on real experiences in their own countries and home institutions. So what I uh, suggest as one of the solutions is instead of uh, a problem-solving approach, we could adopt an appreciative inquiry approach where we can identify what's working. Uh, the system will uh, work well in a given context. And there are islands of excellence within the same country or the state. For example, uh, in our country, we have the... Um, uh, minimum requirements and that uh, by the regulator and the minimum requirements drags uh, uh, or for the sake of uniformity across the country um, uh, the uh, average kind of thing uh, takes the upper hand so we need to have a system which promotes excellence and experience sharing of good practices uh, will go a long way. And one of the ways of promoting excellence is to include the efforts taken by the institution to promote primary care and family physician uh, training within their curriculum, in, within their institutions. 
currently what is counted or measured is how many papers are there and things like that things that can be measured but it doesn't it produces scientists and doctors are scientists no doubt but we also need to measure what we really value uh, and we want primary care to come up apart from uh, increasing in stature pay parity and all those things so that the important stakeholder the learner or the student uh, gets attracted towards primary care as a career choice uh, and so um, all efforts should be taken to compile using an appreciative inquiry about what works for example within our own institution at believers church medical college we send the second year students for secondary hospital postings and the students observe by themselves the uh, pathetic condition of people in rural areas and the services that are available and they see role model doctors who serve in these uh, adverse circumstances and they provide the role model for them uh, so they, they all come back fully charged up and committed but unfortunately the rest of the training is back in the hospital shri ka hospital and they see different role models and so the enlarging the number of uh, months or period the learning experiences as somebody said as sheetal has mentioned in the community and um, um, apprenticeship with um, primary care doctors with, with general practitioners the students must see their role models in that and what are the advantages of being that and um, the importance of developing empathy and the communication of the primary care level all these are possible when uh, the student are placed in the context in which they are expected to function later and so those changes and models that work need to be gathered through an appreciative inquiry approach document it and then uh, forward that document to the policy makers as an advocacy measure so that the uh, curricular changes uh, do come about i am happy that uh, india has moved to competency based medical education but it was um, a document which where everybody wants to increase their share of the pie uh, and uh, nobody wants to focus on the desired competence so there is a need for a curriculum review uh, have in mind the what are the job responsibilities of a, um, a graduate uh, a doctor in a primary health center or a general practitioner and whether the curriculum document addresses those those competencies and uh, as the curriculum planners in india have rightly said it's a document in progress a work in progress and our document would be an additional input that will give ideas uh, to uh, put in place curricular learning experiences for the students so that they can relate and make appropriate career choices thank you i know that thank you very much professor chaku in the you know i can see that you're suggesting that the prestige of primary care could be enhanced as well by more research money coming into it in a sense going back to the basics uh, i suppose you know um, it's about going back to the snow model if you like of epidemiological research hence you know the elimination of cholera that sort of research money coming into that enhancing the prestige but also there a uh, professor chalam uh, dr Ch professor chaku spoke about the value of ethics and communication and I, and i know that you have laid a huge emphasis in the curriculum on eightcom could you please elaborate a bit more on that please yeah uh, yes thank you dr ali see yeah i heard everything nice discussion but i wanted to make two or three quick points one is that yes the competency based curriculum is focusing on the future job orientation for the doctors and in every chapter in every subject in every chapter the focus was on the common diseases and the what are the diseases what are the treatments he has to give 
in his future job description. That was the focus of the competencies, that is well-planned competencies where they focus on the common diseases and the common future job uh, descriptions of the common doctor, that is physician of first contact, that is, as to, that is focused in the competencies. Second is, I wanted to bring in a new dimension. You were asking about how an educationist can contribute for promoting a primary care. Here, see, the communication skills, the attitude, and I know we can teach communication skills, we can teach attitude, I know that, but the requirements of communication skills, requirement of attitude, understanding, are different for different specialties. For example, a physician of first contact, what you call as physician of a primary care physician, he needs more communication skills and he builds a better understanding of the society than a radiologist sitting and reporting a CT scan. So what could be the role? Just because you want more physicians, you are pushing them into physician. No. So what should be the role of the medical educators is at the first year only, you should identify the students. You have very good communication skill. That means you are going to become a very good family physician. If you tell him, yes, he will be oriented towards becoming physician of primary contact. See, what I'm telling is that we know we can teach communication skills, but they are students who have very inherent good communication, good expressive uh, uh, techniques, and also they are very well versed, very well versed with the common societal uh, problems, and they mingle with the society so well. So these type of special features, if you identify in any student, you should tell that student, oh, you are going to become a very good primary physician. So by doing that, yes, we have to promote the primary physician. If someone has no communication skills, he just sits and does the work task man, he, he does a lot of work. Okay, you go and sit somewhere and do like a report CT scan. So do some interventions without talking to anyone. So, this is one dimension which was not discussed here. That's what I wanted to tell you. Because just because you need primary physician, you want to manufacture more primary physician. But how about the suitability, whether this fellow is suitable for primary physician or whether this suitable is for a surgeon, this person is suitable for an obstetric practice, you have to identify them. Then only you can, as an educator, you can tell your student that, ah, oh, you are going to be a good surgeon, go. You, you have that skill, psychomotor skills. Sir. So in that way, we can identify the students and guide them in becoming a, a general physician. I feel so. Thank you very much. We have comments from uh, Iraq, Bangladesh, and Nepal in that order. Uh, Dr. Abu Dahin, please come in. What would your closing comments be? Well, thank you, brother Ali. I'm re really happy to be part of this uh, webinar. I agree with, uh, I, I, I hear that a very important and uh, uh, valid points highlighted by uh, colleagues. We uh, really, we need the political will. Without political will, we cannot change and develop the health system that support uh, prime health care, that support also will encourage medical colleges to develop uh, family medicine training, prime health care training, uh, and we need also, uh, also uh, as my colleague said, uh, incentive supporting the future of primary healthcare worker, make it worthy is an important issue because uh, unless it's rewarding to be family physician or, or primary healthcare worker, they will, will not. They will shift to, uh, to, to other specialties, super specialties, because it will bring a lot of uh, much more uh, income to them this is what 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 what's it's what we face in in Iraq. We do not prefer because the most of the income come from the private, and the private money come from working in the hospital and in the in some specialties that most junior doctor want to be enrolled, not because the country need no, but but because it it earn more money for them. So we need to support uh, the reward for family physician for general practitioner to be. Uh, and so junior doctor will attend us in, I think uh, GPs in, in UK have a, 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 a reasonable income and, a, 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 and the prestige also. So uh, this is what we miss both, not the, the income, 
uh, on the prestige in, in our uh, area. Uh, but again, I, I, I highlight that it's an, there's opportunity that WHO governments should work uh, toward the universal health coverage and millennium development, uh, sustainable development goals. So we need uh, uh, to have a, a move toward the uh, policymaker, politician to support, uh, to make it in real, to support this specialty. And we need to, to cooperate other uh, specialties also to, to re realize what's the importance of, uh, of general practice and primary health care for the, uh, for the, uh, the health and the well-being of the community and the people in, in, in all the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, actually, I'm very, uh, it's a very great opportunity for me to uh, be here. Uh, I think we have three areas to consider. First of all, uh, regarding the policymakers or government, which is the prime actor of the healthcare system in our countries. So governments always, democratic governments always want to uh, provide something, something visible a big hospital, a big building, that is public will. That, that, is, that is the policy of government, uh, uh, democratic government, because they will stay for five years or uh, 10 years. They will provide something. Which is, um, uh, Shujata Madam is here. She's very experienced. She, I think she will agree that this is the policy makers. They want something visible. So here, Global Health Academy can work with them to arrange a stakeholder engagement to motivate them that not only visible thing, the silent killers, we have to uh, fight with the silent kill killers who primary care physicians are working there. So here is one area. Second area is that we have to look at why doctors here are going to primary care. Those doctors who are not getting chances in post-graduation, they are uh, taking general practice as their profession. Because it is not that those who are in the primary care, they, are, they have not um, ability to go for a specialist, but they have no time or money to go there. Some doctors, there are some doctors after completion of their basic medical degree, they have to earn money for their family. So they are not uh, managing time to go to the higher specialties. So in that case, we have to develop a curriculum which is deliverable. Recently, we have conducted a blended learning program on COPD in Bangladesh in association with the uh, DG Health, the Director General of Health. And we have published that paper in uh, BMC that uh, if we can arrange a blended learning program that is GP will, primary care physician will be at his center, not to attend the uh, hospital for full time. He will work, he will earn money for his family. And also he will get training at the community level. And after a long, long time, after say one year or uh, two years, he will be uh, examined, he will be evaluated whether he, he's, he has the level to be a primary care physician. And third one is that the profile of primary care physician should be equalized with other specialists. Then the doctors from the beginning, they will decide, yes, I will go to the, I will go for the, uh, for a primary care physician. So th these three ideas we can, if we can consider, then I think we can get a success. Thank you. Ali. Bakari, um, in a minute, could you please summarize what your comments, final comments would be on this session? Yeah. My comments, first one is... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Sheetal Bhandari? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, my approach would be to look at the primary healthcare in two approaches. One is the basic medical doctor and one is the specialist one. Uh, uh, Regarding the basic medical doctor, we have to think about the three things. The training, uh, the selection first, who we are going to select, 
the training uh, that happens in our institute and the deployment. So selection is the big thing. We have to be very, very careful how we select our graduates because that is where we have worked a lot in pattern. And recently Nepal introduced a common medical examination, uh, entrance examination, and we sort of felt betrayed with that one, but uh, I will be not talking about that one. Then the training in our institute is very important. Then what Thomas sir was telling is the role model, no? how you treat your colleagues in your, in your institute is very, very important because your students will pick up it, pick it up. So try to give respect to the GPs if they are working there. Try to give respect to the primary care workers who are working there. Otherwise your students will not appreciate that one. No? So that is what we have been doing. And for example, while developing the curriculum, the PBL case, uh, we work in a team. I, wa I, wa I was in public health. I work with a clinician, a renowned uh, pediatrician to write a nutrition case. Similarly, we uh, like basic science work with the clinician and even in the PBL cases, we work together. We were the tutor and co-tutors. I think that is the way to show that a student that we actually care for you and then every specialist matter, no? In the basic sense. For the deployment, actually we work with the Ministry of Health and Population in the national health system. And they were very helpful. They are the one who deploy our graduates in the rural and remote areas of Nepal now. So I think there is a three tire of the coin here, no, not the two tire of coin. Regarding the specialist degree, I think it's, a, it's the role model. You have to show what you can do. And if you have a very good GP role model in your institute and in, in your country, I think they will be very, very motivated. For example, our vice chancellor now is GP. We all respect him. He is the renowned GP of Nepal. So everybody loves him. We respect him. So I think we have to nurture that attitude, that culture in our student and they can see themselves as a VC of any university of Nepal or any world. And I think that is where we can promote the primary care. Otherwise, I think we'll be only talking and doing nothing. Thank you. It's the role model of GP. And I suppose we bring in Ms. Jatha Rao at this stage, because I suppose, you know, the highest award given to a doctor in India, it is named after a GP, isn't it, Ms. Rao? Please come in. Uh, which doctor are you referring to? The GC to? Roy Award. Oh, Dr. B. C. Rover. Yeah, that is, uh, yes. And they give it to all the people who have made a lot of advances in science and scientific discoveries and so on. It's a very prestigious award, yes. So, um, final comments from you. Well, you know, I found it fascinating to hear that, uh, uh, to hear that all of us thinking alike uh, and uh, problems that, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, doctors from Bangladesh, Nepal, and uh, you know other countries have said is really so similar to what our own experiences. And the tragedy with India, if I may say so, is that what has been said right now, say by Dr. Chako and so on, these are observations that were already made in the Mozilla Committee in 1959, when they said that you cannot have an allopathy doctor who doesn't understand the society, doesn't understand uh, the milieu and the environment in which is asked to work in the primary care, doesn't understand uh, uh, how to do teamwork, doesn't have communication skills, doesn't uh, know the basic diseases that the, the people that they require from primary care physicians, it can never succeed. I mean, these were, it was very interesting that in 1959, the Mozilla committee uh, made scathing remarks like this on the, on the way in which medical doctors were being created in India. And so many years have gone by now, so 40, 60 years, and we're still where we were then. And that is a tragedy. You know, the power of the clinicians is so strong that uh, it is constantly the, 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 um, the icon that is promoted in the, in the profession is largely super specialist, specialists working in corporate settings, that's the kind of uh, uh, models that are uh, thrown. And that's why many speakers have commented that it's so important to equalize the primary care physician in terms of both pay parity and social prestige and in terms of uh, respect within the profession to a specialist. And it's only when these things happen and the family medicine is taught and the primary care physician is really uh, uh, taught and skilled in the kind of jobs that he's supposed to do you know, as a primary physician, 
the profession won't really improve. And it is in this context that I think in 2010, uh, there was a very serious attempt to try and change the whole medical curriculum by the then Medical Council of India. And they tried to uh, say that, as it was mentioned by earlier speakers, that right in the first year itself, expose the students to uh, multidisciplinary subjects like economics, sociology, anthropology, and uh, you know, understand the environment in which, uh, and medical history, history of medicine, so that they have a much broader understanding of medicine than just knowing the anatomy of a human body and uh, fixing a drug there and trying to cure a disease. That's, that's important. But they also felt that the human being is just not uh, the illness, you know, the social medicine aspect of it. The environment in which the person is coming from, uh, is it alcoholism, is it poverty, is it malnutrition? These are sort of uh, issues, the determinants of health need to be understood <coughs> in their holistic manner. So that was the idea. And <coughs> their, their uh, concept was that later on, after basic uh, skills are given, the students later in the fourth year or so would be asked to choose whether they want to become a GP or they want to go in for clinical specialization. I think some such <coughs> reform is very much required. I think the most important thing in India today is changing the medical curriculum. We have a huge opportunity because the government has very boldly reformed and revamped the old Medical Council of India as a national medical commission with extensive uh, uh, legislative powers. And I think, uh, you know, if, if they could uh, really come up with a very good, uh, well-designed uh, um, curriculum and also bring in this whole concept as some speakers were mentioning, respect for the GP. Don't look down upon the GP as somebody who's a loser, who couldn't make it to the specialist, uh, become a specialist who's not so bright, and therefore he became a GP. That's not true. That's simply not true. And that has to change. And unless and until those, uh, those kind of you know, uh, value systems are brought in, and this can only be put in by the doctors by themselves. It cannot be brought in by po politicians or by bureaucrats. It's the doctors who have to uh, respect the GPs, the doctors, the nurses, and so on and so forth, their own profession. So they must value. And I think this kind of a value system and, and the skill development has to come from the National Medical Commission. It has to come from within the doctors' associations and medical profession. And uh, only then will, uh, will, will you know, the, the profession pick up. But, um, but then it's a long story and a long path, but I think it's worth taking because we will be destroyed by more and more COVID coming in unless and until we have a very strong primary health care uh, system in our country or any other country. Uh, we've seen what a devastation uh, uh, and havoc that COVID has, for, uh, has caused in the United States, largely because they don't have primary care systems. I mean, they're not even able to do the immunization so rapidly as many of our countries we would be able to, you know. So that is the importance of uh, uh, primary care and uh, it is the foundation. There's no getting away from it. And uh, I think, uh, I'm sorry I came in late. I'm sure the, the discussions were very rich and very useful. And I do hope that uh, all the ideas will be put together and, uh, and you know, the issues taken up within the leadership of the medical profession as well as the policy makers. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. You're right. The discussions have been very rich. In fact, the chat boxes have been very rich. We are approaching two hours. So I would really have liked to have invited some people, particularly, you know, we've had some really good comments from Dr. Sooth. Uh, Professor Srinivas makes the point about the five Ps, um, which is political commitment, policy by medical council, a PG course, pay parity and prestige in the community. I think four and five are definitely very strong points. Um, 
Now, I think it's only fair that some of you, we've had quite a few responses to the poll that we put out, and it's only fair that I share the results. It's a straw poll. By no means would I say that this is a definitive, if you like, evidence-based poll, but it's only fair that you know you have filled out the poll and you should see what the results are. So um, hope everyone can see here. So we've had 99 responses. So which area of healthcare do people feel is more critical? Of course, it's primary healthcare, according to 99 of you. Which area of healthcare does medical education focus on? 70% um, of you thought that it was primary healthcare. And the problems that uh, can be addressed mainly are in primary care. Most problems can be addressed in primary care. 90% of you believe that. Now, you also, 54% of you believe that undergraduate medical education enables doctors to practice independently as GPs and family doctors in the primary care. I suppose the discussion today, uh, there might be some points of contest within that. So I'd right, like to thank you very much for joining in. And um, before I go, I'd like to say that if you could stay on after the meeting, I'll show you how to download your own certificate. Now you have filled in the webinar attendance form, but you will still be able to download your own certificate if you stay on. And those of you who have to go, we've still got the Google form that you submitted. Now I, I, I'll pass you. Uh, I'll pass on to Liz for her closing remarks, followed by Neil. And uh, just to say that we will be back on the 17th of March. On the 17th of March, again at 11 GMT, to discuss um, a formal program of primary care postgraduate education that is being developed. If any one of you were interested, and you will get an email out in due course. So. Thank you, thank you so much for joining in. And from my side, keep safe, Liz. And likewise, keep safe and thank you for that inspiring conversation and that message that we have to take this further. We have global, we have national, and we have local opportunities to embed family medicine and strengthen primary health care through the medical education system and, and wider. And we need to take that up because we need to move the movement of primary health care forward and we have the UN, the World Economic Forum, the World Development Report, the WHO, all, all throwing a lifeline because they are recognising that a strong primary health care system is the way forward. So together we'll work but thank you for those inspiring comments. Neil? Well, it, it, it truly is the foundation, I think, of running really good, cost-effective, high-quality healthcare systems. And I'm running now to go and discharge some patients after their renal transplants at three and a half days, which is half the time we would have discharged them. I couldn't be doing that if I couldn't rely on quality primary care when they get home. So thanks, everyone, very much. It's been so um, impressive, forceful, that everyone wants to push in the same direction and um, have a very good weekend. Thank you. Keep, all of you keep safe. Thank you so much. But don't forget what I'd... Uh, so those of you who stayed behind, please type x.code.in. I've put the link on the chat box. And you will have to go to that website and sign up and you will get an email to automatically verify and enter your login. So I will demonstrate that as well. So you see over here, I'm on x.code.in. I have already registered. I'm taking a little time so that you can do the same as well. You can unmute yourself if you have any queries. Yeah, yeah, yeah.